Hi everyone, it's episode twenty here on the Stars and Startups podcast with me, Varun Bhumidi. We're ending week ten of the podcast with a story of a popular coffee shop and coffee company that has seen demand for premium Indian coffee grow and capture the mind space of Indians looking to consume good coffee. With that, they have seen competitions rise and their cafe business gain popularity. On the episode, I chat about their eight-year journey and the business of coffee with Matt Chitranjan. Who, along with his wife and co-founder Namrata, have made premium Indian coffee accessible to Indians. I'm a big fan. Have a listen. Also, Matt and I talk about a giveaway at the end of the episode. And uh, as we are on episode twenty here, I have posted in show notes the way you can also become eligible for the giveaway. So don't forget to check that out. That's in the show notes. Um, we're giving away a bag of coffee. Uh, from Blue Tokai for those who basically talk about this podcast with their friends on social media. It's that simple. You can win coffee, and all your flus talk about the Stars and Startups podcast with your friends. Okay, let's hear from Matt. Hey, Matt! Welcome, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Fantastic. A lot of people are probably missing the Blue Tokai fries and all the cool things that happen, you know, when they get uh, to to visit a Blue Tokai store. Um, have you been getting frantic calls? Not so much for the fries, but for the coffee we have, we have. Uh, luckily, we have around sixty percent of our locations are open now uh, for takeaway and delivery, and a few uh, cities are open for dining also. So. At this moment, uh, you know, takeaways are probably going through the roof, or you know, you're you're finding more of your equipment and other products, uh, you know, a lot more. Yeah, there's been a evolution. So in the beginning, so in April, uh, people were almost, I would say, 75% of the orders were for beans and equipment. Uh, people were very hesitant to order any prepared item outside of their home. Now, the longer the situation has gone on, there's now an overwhelming evidence that you can't get uh, Corona through food. So consumer confidence has increased, and now people are uh, starting to order more brewed coffee and, and food from the cafes also. Hey, Matt. Um, you know, I know we jumped straight into the conversation, but uh, you know, there, there's so much story to, to starting of Google Time, and, you know, being at the forefront uh, you know what most people call the third wave of coffee. Right? There's this whole buzz around uh, the US and then in Southeast Asia, where third wave. What did third wave mean? It's primarily getting coffee from specific estate, right? Instead of having this mass-produced coffee. How did uh, this third wave happen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not necessarily getting it from uh, sourcing from a particular estate is just part of it, but. So to me, third wave means that you're focusing on quality throughout the process. So uh, from sourcing to roasting to brewing, quality of the beverage and the coffee is the ultimate consideration. So when when you started Dutokai, was that where you saw a huge gap in the market that you wanted to fill? Because I know that you are an economist. Right? Yeah. Was <laughs> it? So uh, actually, we didn't. Uh, we started. My, my wife and I started Bluetooth Guy more on a, a whim than than anything else. It wasn't. We did some detailed study of the coffee uh, industry in India and identified. Okay, this is the gap here, and let's let's target this gap. It was that we were looking for good tasting coffee for us to consume at home, and so we started initially just searching around, trying to find other roasters who would be able to to give us that experience. And then only after we started uh, this process and couldn't find what we were looking for, and we thought, okay, maybe this is something that we should do ourselves. So it wasn't uh, uh, the business aspect was sort of uh, superseded by our desire to have a good cup of coffee. Uh, um, so you, when when you did start, uh, you you had just come from the U.S. or you had already spent a little bit of time in, the, in India. No, I, uh, yeah, I moved. Uh, I moved in this January of 2011 to Chennai, and I was working in an organization doing uh, research projects. Uh, so that's actually where I met Namrata. So we were both working at the same organization, and so we were there for about a year. Then uh, 
uh, Chennai wasn't exactly the the city that <laughs> that I enjoyed. So uh, Namitha's parents were from Delhi, and so in visiting Delhi, I I, I really liked it here. So we moved to Delhi in uh, 2012 still working and then only after about 6 months in we decided we were both at points in our careers where we wanted to do something on our own so wow. then this oh, well chennai is chennai is my hometown so you know you can you can only say so so many bad things about it <laughs> no i mean my family is from there my my uncles live there my you know i i visit uh, and actually it was a great place for us socially i just think that uh, weather it's quite hot And, and it's uh um, still year. very yeah it's and it's also a little bit of a traditional place uh very family centric um and i just found the delhi to be more of a more uh, maybe cosmopolitan city <laughs> you know when you guys started um, i remember in about 2014 is when i first reached out to you when i was starting my um, you know uh, online marketplace for coffee and when going through that process i realized there was all the other brands and then there was google brand where you know there was a uh, subscription you had you know specific uh, you know coffee sort of specifications i would imagine that a lot of that involved not only educating the audience but also spending that much extra time and now you have so many roasters right mm-hmm. uh, kind of writing in in my opinion i think they wrote the code tales of yoda guy how do you think about this no i mean i think uh we also what what we did is not like we were the first company in the world to do this right so in a way we've also written the code tales of uh especially coffee companies around the world right, right. it's just that maybe in India at the time that we started no one was doing the combination of things that we were doing at that time and so we had uh maybe a, we were the first to do it here but at the same time the especially coffee has been in other countries for for a long time so uh i think it's nice to see that other people are following this it's nice to see that this market is growing and and uh i think that's great uh the the In the seven years you've done this, what has been, or eight years, uh, what has been the biggest kind of shift uh, in mindset or, or you know trend? Wow. Uh, I mean, I think there hasn't been a huge shift. I think it's been every year we notice a gradual shift more towards premium products. I don't think. Uh, I mean, coffee is one example, but you can see this also with with beer the craft beer movement now is quite strong in india you see it with artisanal cheese companies uh, now there's many of these uh, yogurt uh, all kind of these food items every year there's more and more brands coming up and and more options available and so i think as as a consumer that's fantastic that's uh, that's great that people are moving away from kind of the the mass uh, average quality items towards these uh, more carefully produced Uh, food of products when you look at craft and this is niche right there's a there's a certain segment that that um, you know wants it um, they're obviously looking for more and more um, you know kind of uh, things to go towards but does it mean the wallet share is still small of these customers that you're going after So I think there's a mix. The the sort of the the hardcore coffee consumers who already have a fairly evolved idea of what specialty coffee is, uh, and they're they're consuming a lot of coffee. They're getting the equipment. They're getting the scales. They're getting the grinders. So in in that segment, that would be you know a significant share. You're, if you're drinking two, three, four cups of coffee a day, then then that uh, a significant portion of money is going towards that. but i think as we've uh, evolved as a company our goal is to get more and more people into drinking better quality coffee i think already specialty coffee can be quite alienating to the average consumer right you think that there's these specific recipes that you have to use to brew the coffee and you have to invest in this expensive fancy equipment and and that creates a very high barrier to get more and more people interested in it and uh and we want to do what we can to sort of 
break down this barrier, whether it's through making uh, like ready to drink options with with cold brews or ready to brew options like those uh, single serve easy pour sachets that we have. I think it's figuring out ways to reach people because ultimately, once you start drinking better quality coffee, it's very difficult to go back to uh, you know the the commercial or instant uh, coffee. So it takes a lot of effort to push people along in that journey. But once you get them along, then uh, they tend to be a customer for, for a long time. Would you say education is still slow though? Like, you know, people learning uh, and so on and getting into it. Is that still a slow process? Yeah, I don't, it's not like this, this hockey stick growth that you see with, you know, some you know, other, uh, other brands or other products. Um, and I think, for us, having the cafes was also very important towards this uh, process. Uh, it's one thing to try and explain to people what's different when you have a, a website. It's a totally uh, different experience when you actually get to interact with someone in real life and you have them taste the coffee. So that's why for us, really focusing on training our baristas and, and, and having them be able to prepare a great cup of coffee, but also engage with customers in a meaningful manner to explain what's different about our coffee compared to the standard coffee in the market was important. I remember in the earlier part of uh, the Google Pie journey, there was, you could, you could get your coffee prepared in any kind of equipment that you wanted that would be mm -hmm. there in the store, right? I would imagine, you know, you probably had a harder time to explain to a person what would taste better for what to, uh, versus what our personal preference was. Was that why you yeah. moved away from that? Yeah, so it was, uh, as you grow, you have to make some kind of trade-offs. Uh, and so actually what was happening is by having customers be able to choose any, any roast and any method, uh, it was leading to a very long preparation time for the drinks. And so then the, on the one hand, it's great to have all this variety in options but on the other hand if you have to wait 15 minutes for a cup of coffee then that kind of ruins the experience so for us in order to sort of streamline operations uh we restricted what what kind of brewing methods we offered and what what most we offered on each methods you mentioned the ready to drink options and, and others um was that just a natural evolution that you know you're, you're trying to create more options for uh, you know easy consumption or was it saying, you know what, uh, we are creating all these uh, you know, different consumers who like different coffee, and hence we want to be ahead of the market and try to create new segments. I mean, this actually was really, uh, sorry, I'm just pouring some water. Uh, this was a response to instant coffee. Uh, so instant coffee is dominant in India. And so they've sort of established uh, instant coffee is the benchmark and, and, and so you have to come up with ways to have the convenience of instant coffee but still deliver on the flavor that we want from our, uh, our brain. So this was sort of our bridge between that. So the, it doesn't require any equipment, it's easy to use, it's self-contained. So if you're heard about specialty coffee or you heard about our brand and you want to try it out without investing in equipment, this is the product for you. So if you look at the product itself, it's, it's very similar to a tea bag, right? You just kind of place it on a cup and you kind of pour hot water into it. Um, funny enough, uh, you know, yesterday a friend of mine uh, was trying to order, uh, you know, she came back from Vietnam about months ago, well, few, many months ago, and she's like, oh, I'm, I'm locked up at home and, and I want to order something. And she actually picked up, uh, you know, the, the ready to drink, uh, Version, like, uh, and she was extremely impressed with it, right? Because she's she's a novice; she has no equipment, and for her, it was just a very easy kind of set. So I get what you're saying; like, it is just an easier way for people to consume. I also saw that uh, you guys launched a different type of grind, which is called uh, chutney, right? Is that yeah, yeah? So that was before. So chutney was before the easy pour because. Uh, we would get a lot of inquiries from customers who are saying, I don't have any equipment at home. How can I make your coffee? Mm -hmm. So chani, the chani method was our way to, to, to have an offering for those people who could at least taste the coffee and understand the flavor that you can get from uh, freshly roasted and gone coffee compared to instant coffee without having, again, to invest in equipment. 
Now, Changi is, it's good, uh, but it's still, you end up with a lot of uh, fines in your cup. So it works better if you have a paper filter, or you put a muslin cloth on top, but then, you know, once you start explaining that to a first time customer, then your eyes glaze over and they're like, oh, this is complicated. I'm not going to do it. So if you uh, first, they start off with the chani and then they, they write back with some feedback, then we can say, okay, to make the chani even better, you can do these things. Uh, that was sort of our, our goal for that. Um, it's interesting that you, you the, the easy board that the tea bag you mentioned, because actually we, we tried to do it with a tea bag initially. Uh, because I think that form function is very, uh, you know, appreciated or, or everybody understands how to do it. Yeah. And, it, and actually with the easy pours, you, you, we found that some people are, are thinking of it as a tea bag, so they don't open the sachet. They ah. just start pouring water directly over it. And obviously that ruins the, I mean, you're going to get a very under extracted cup. But actually the problem with the tea bag is the fluid dynamics uh, don't work out. You need water to pass through the coffee in order to extract the flavor. So with the tea bag, unless you're dipping the entire time for five minutes, or you let it sit for a very long time, you're going to end up with a uh, weak and under extracted coffee. But isn't that how, uh, to some extent, how a French press works? Yeah, but French press, it's totally immersed in the tea bag because it's in the filter and the coffee is packed in there. It, uh, the water doesn't pass through very easily. So, so with a French so press, pretty. yeah, with a French press, because the grounds get to spread out within the cup or within the, the French press pot, uh, it's able to extract. But uh, with the tea bag, because it's compressed in a filter, it leads to a under extracted coffee. You know, uh, when when we look at Pluto uh, Guide today, you have your core coffee items and then there are products that make its way to the stores, and then there are products that make its way to the website. How do you think of this as a brand? Um, do you think about it, uh, you know, like what will work for the audience in different locations? How do you go about product development, partnerships, uh, and so on? Yeah, I mean, so I think we look at ourselves as a coffee company first. So I think it's evolved, uh, different channels have grown and become more prominent at different times in our, our business. But ultimately, uh, coffee is the core product, and it's just figuring out what's the best channel for this particular audience. Uh, so initially, it was only an online business, uh, and that was fine when we were catering to mostly niche coffee consumers. Uh, the cafes have been incredibly helpful to reach a wider audience and expose more people to better quality coffee. Now, with the, the current situation, cafes are, are you know, very restricted. And so now we're seeing that the online business is doing really well because people who have come and visited our cafes are looking to have coffee at home. And then so now they're ordering coffee from us online. And you are looking at retail, this FMC business, you need to have different products for that because of the, you know, one is the, the shelf life requirement. It's, you know, it takes a week, 10 days for the product to even reach the shelves and it's going to be sitting on the shelves for two, three more weeks. So uh, you have to have different products that are willing or that are able to still give the same customer experience, but be shelf stable. Uh, so I think we look at each channel um, differently and, and develop different products for that. And, and sort of how we look at each channel has evolved over time. As well. Hey guys, sorry for the interruption. Hope you've enjoyed the episode thus far. A gentle reminder to like or subscribe to the podcast wherever you're viewing or listening to this episode. Also, take a look at the giveaway in our show notes uh, for a goodie bag from Lutokai. So do that uh, and uh, yeah, let's get back to this episode. You would say that the uh, stores were net, have been a net positive because I'm guessing you got the branding, you got visibility that you wouldn't normally get. Uh, you know, I, was it for about... Two, three years uh, in the beginning, you were purely yeah, three on years we had, Yeah. Yeah, I would say we've never been able to reach to where we are without the stores. Uh, it's just, I think it's very, it's not, I'm not that the stores are easy. The stores have their own challenges and, and everybody will tell you that uh, opening a cafe or opening a restaurant is, is incredibly low margins and very difficult. And that's obviously true. Uh, but it's also true uh, that it's difficult to scale a pure FMCG business. You need to invest a lot in marketing and distribution, and, and that's also very 
costly and difficult uh, channel to, to succeed in. So I think for us, having the three different channels, the stores, plus the B2B supply, plus the online, has really helped us. And, and that's been sort of core, core to our strategy since, since we opened our first cafe. Would, would you say uh, the business now is uh, 50% online, 50% offline? Or in terms of uh, net revenues, I'm not talking about uh, you know, bookings. Yeah. Uh, so prior to the corona, it was two-thirds online, one-third offline. And now it's moved towards uh, more than 50% online and, and uh, slightly less than 50% offline. So offline then would have less of a coffee and more of the experience. Um, how do you guys think about kind of building that? Like, I, I would imagine now that you have a lot of people also managing, uh, you know, and, and just uh, you know, especially at this time, like, uh, you know, what what are you thinking about uh, kind of the offline strategy? So offline right now is. Uh we're in more of a wait and see approach. Uh, I think the cap, I don't see the COVID fundamentally changing people's behaviors towards cafes. Cafes have been around for 600 years. They've seen things far worse than, <laughs> than this, this virus. Uh, and still, still they exist in, in a, you know, almost a similar form to what it used to be. Uh, so right now it's about optimizing, the cafes are about optimizing the menu for takeaway and delivery putting in place additional hygiene, safety measures to, to make our spaces as safe as possible, uh, both for our staff and for the customers, um, uh, and then uh, continue to operate them. Uh, but so we, we are not going to open up any uh, new locations uh, until at least there's some clarity uh, uh, towards like a uh, vaccine or a, a yeah. stable treatment for this. But um, I do think that they're, they're they're going to be an important part of our strategy once uh, going forward. I just want to take you back to kind of working with growers and, and you know, working on these, on these farms, right? Because that's a very core aspect of uh, the guy is kind of putting these farms first, uh, in a way, uh, highlighting the brand, etc. How has the relationship changed? Uh, with these uh, farms over the years? Yeah, so I mean, uh, it's interesting in that the, the same core group of estates that we used to source from when we first started, we still continue to source today. So that's been a very strong relationship that's grown over time. And, and that only could have happened because of uh, commitment on both parts, right? They've, they've, uh, they've been happy to, or, or we're lucky that they've continued to work with us when they could sell the coffee to other people now. And at the same time, we want to continue to, to deepen that relationship and, and, and support them. Um, so in those estates now they're because of that deeper relationship, some, some estates are willing to do more exp experimental processes that maybe they wouldn't have been willing to do in the beginning. Uh, so whether it's in terms of, of picking or, or post harvest processing, uh, we're we're able to do some interesting and exciting things there, and then at the same time, as the brand has grown, now there's uh, you know more estates who are interested in partnering with us. So we've been able to add uh, new estates every year uh, that that we source from, and and I think that helps. I think especially for India and coffee producers right now, commodity prices are so low. So if you're selling coffee in the commodity market. You're, you're in a lot of trouble. So uh, one is getting your production up to a point where you can access the specialty market uh, is, is incredibly important for them because that's where you get the, the prices that then can support your, you know, the effort that goes into growing this crop. Uh, so uh, the more and more people that, that can, can sell their coffee, or, uh, can produce specialty grade and then spell, sell it, uh, the better. Uh, for the industry, there's obviously only a limited amount of coffee that gets sold, right? Uh, how many? I mean, can you share how much uh, kind of coffee you sell a month, in a way? Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, prior prior to uh, COVID, it was around twenty tons of coffee. Uh, now it's about half that. Oh wow! Uh, 
I mean, so to 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 sell twenty tons of coffee, uh, you know, every month, you probably have to have uh, so many growers and, and so much inventory. And because because I know that you keep uh, you know cycling through uh, you know kind of uh, estates and and growths as well. Um, how do you guys plan for something like that? Yeah, so uh, there's only one harvest, so we have to estimate how much coffee we're going to sell in the upcoming year, and then buy that coffee during the harvest period. Uh, then we warehouse the coffee ourselves. We have climate-controlled warehouses uh, in Delhi, Bombay, and now Bangalore, where we store the coffee, and then uh, we set a calendar. So different coffees also age at different levels. So if a uh, coffee we've identified that's going to age quickly, then we'll make sure that we release that at the start of the year. Whereas coffees that preserve over time, then, then we know that maybe that can be a second half release. Uh, so then we have to plan, uh, plan both our purchasing and our product release calendar accordingly. So that means if there's break that growth, you can't really, you know, go back and say, hey, yeah, we, we can't. 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 I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, that, uh, we've been fortunate in, in that we've, uh, our forecasts have been fairly accurate. So there are some coffees that run out of stock earlier, but it, we've never been in a situation where, where we don't have any coffee in a particular category to, to sell. I, I remember ordering, uh, you know, one particular, uh, you know, coffee about a couple of months ago, which was aged in a, in a wine bed, uh, Sula. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was phenomenal. I, I love the flavors. I love, uh, you know, I, I wish I bought more, right? I, I wish I had more. Uh, how do you go about, uh, uh, you know, creating that? Yeah, so I mean, I think that was uh, just what well, we saw people doing a lot of these whiskey barrel aged coffee. And so we thought wine would be something. Uh, already there's coffees that have wine characteristics associated with them. So we thought that maybe wine would be a good. Uh, good op option, good alternative. Um, so we reached out to Sula and they were interested in, in doing the collaboration. And so they sent us some barrels and we did some R&D in terms of how long to age the coffee for and, and what particular coffee should we be putting in the barrels? Uh, how often do we rotate them? And, and, and it turned out quite well. So now now we have another, another batch is currently aging. So you'll be able to order it in another two months or so. Oh, fantastic. But um, I would imagine then there was so much prep work that went into creating that as well. Um, so is that like a long lead time to create something like that? Yeah, I would say from, from when we conceptualized it to when we were actually able to release it, it took around six months. So we have, I, I mean, we, we have a team that works on different, different ideas, whether it's different, uh, you know, different ready-to-drink options, different processing methods, different uh, blends. Uh, so people are always working on these different experiments. So is that the innovation, product innovation, uh, you know, kind of team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the roasting team all works on that. So myself and all of the roasting team, we work on, so even with the easy pours, that was a lot of, uh, our roasting team visiting, uh, like getting different samples of, of paper filters and testing out different grinds and and really figuring out what worked best for that particular product. Had you always been roasting your own coffee, man? Always. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, I started roasting in 2006, 2007. Uh, uh, but it was just a hobby. Uh, I, I had a very small roaster and I would get green beans and just roast them for myself. Uh, I never really thought it would be something that uh, I would do as a, a as a career, uh, and, and actually now uh, it's been it's been some time since I roasted coffee. Uh, but there was maybe two years ago, everybody was sick, and so I had to uh, step in and roast. And it's amazing that I'm so much worse of a roaster than the people that we have now. So it's uh, it's it's really great to see that that, that they're at a totally another level than where I was. <laughs> it, it is an art, right? Like you need to know. Uh, I, what do they do? Like they hear the popping. There's, there's so much. Uh, uh, it's an art oh, that, <laughs> You hear the popping, like that mark in the first crack is important. But I mean, I think now with technology, there's a lot of uh, you 
know, all of our roasts are hooked up to the computer so that we can see uh, how the coffee is progressing in real time. And, and so it's less uh, visual and more setting a profile and then cupping the coffee because very small changes in the roast profile actually have a significant impact in the flavor. So one is you have to be good at manipulating the, the gas and gas settings and airflow settings to achieve a particular profile. But then you also have to be very good at tasting coffee because ultimately that's what matters. It doesn't matter how pretty your curves look if, if the coffee itself doesn't taste good. Right. Um, so, uh, going back to the taste, right? Um, I would imagine that because it's a natural item, um, the taste differs every year from each estate. Um, yeah. How do you manage that? Because you can't build consistency from an estate. So if I, if I like uh, you know, one of the estate's uh, coffee from last year, uh, you know, the next batch I get, they don't actually taste the same. How do you manage that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think people sort of appreciate that now, uh, that every year's harvest will have a slightly different flavor. Um, and then we have, so we have cafe blends that we try and keep consistent for a particular amount of time, but even those we rotate. I, I think that, um, uh, as you pointed out, coffee is, uh, uh, like, it's changing. Even within a year, the, the flavor will change. So maybe... After uh, nine months, it's the, some of the, the notes will change. So at that point, we take a call whether we want to uh, keep selling that as a, as a single estate coffee or, or put it into a different product. Uh, but it'll never be. You'll never have the exact same flavor year to year. And, uh, and I think that's something that's, that's interesting and, and should be you know, celebrated rather than seen as a, a challenge to overcome. Now that you educated the market and there's so many other roasters uh, also competing for the same coffee. Uh, you know, is there ever some uh, competitiveness that you go and kind of, you know, kind of corner the market for a certain type of coffee? How does that work? No, because ultimately, even if, uh, let's say you're another roaster and you buy the exact same lot of coffee that I have, uh, you're going to roast it according to your style and, and your way. And, uh, and we'll roast it according to our style. So yeah, I, I think of it more of uh, ingredients, right? If if you have a basket of, if we both have the same basket of ingredients, you're going to produce a different dish than I'll produce. So uh, I don't see it as a, a competition. Uh, it's more of a, I mean, I think the more, more specialty or premium coffee roasters there are, they're reaching different audiences and they're widening the market. And so uh, I think that's a that's a net positive for everybody. So everybody's doing their fair share of educating the market and growing the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now that you've launched these ready, uh, this ready to consume products, uh, are you seeing a new set segment of users coming in, or are you seeing uh, you know cannibalization of the existing? Product? No, I, it's, it's a mix of both. Uh, I think also for existing uh, con, uh, customers, the, the easy pours have a, a use case, right? Maybe you don't want to bring your equipment everywhere with you. Maybe in the office, at home, you're happy to make a cup of coffee, but in the office, you'd rather use the easy pour. When you're traveling, uh, this is more convenient to take than, than taking your coffee equipment with you. Um, at the same time, we see people who are only getting this, who've never bought the... the like the coffee packets from it. So uh, I think it's it's a mix of both. Okay. Um, from a uh, investor standpoint, they probably thought uh, that, that the ready consume market would probably blow up and that would be great for their money. Is that how it's working out? I mean, it's early. It's very early. Uh, we only launched it. We launched it right before the lockdown. So oh, Perfect uh, timing. Yeah, well, perfect timing in some sense, uh, but also supply chain is a little bit, uh, needs some uh, sorting out still. Uh, so, um, but I think, not our investor set, but uh, I would say sort of the, the, the typical investor looks at a, a company and they want them to focus on one particular channel. So uh, either be an FMCG coffee company or be a cafe company. This mix of having cafes and FMCG and online B two B, I think uh, it takes a particular investor set to appreciate that. 
uh, and, and so we're fortunate that we found a group of people who are, who are supportive of our vision. Actually, it's a good question to ask. So what is Blutokai uh, today? Is it, you know, it has a change, it has all these products. How do you define yourself? Because you can, I mean, best way to be, say, it's omni-channel. Do both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we look at, I mean, I think of it as a coffee company. So whatever channel it is that we can reach customers who want to have a good cup of coffee, that's where we want to be. So the cafes are, are uh, uh, like a good channel for us for growing the brand and educating customers. But also at the same time, like I like to go to cafes. So uh, <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I want to go for a coffee, I, 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 you know, like I would like to be able to go to one of our cafes wherever right. I am in, in the country. Um, the same way uh, with each of the channels is targeting a different customer. With the launch of all these hyperlocal services, um, you know, Zomato, Sumi, etc., um, did did you see uh, the convenience reduce? Uh, you know, from people buying coffee uh, online to just ordering cups from the locations, was that a shift? You saw it, does that continue? Yeah, it's interesting actually because uh, my wife is a perfect example of this. So before the lockdown, uh, even though we have access to all of the equipment and all of the coffee, she would order coffee from the cafe through Swiggy every single day. Uh, now during the lockdown, she got used to, again, used to brewing coffee at home. And so now she brews coffee at home every day, even though the cafes are still open and she could go back to ordering. It's just that now, uh, once you get used to a particular habit, it's, uh, you stick with that for some time. So I was asking her, why, like, why do you do this now? You used to order every day and then you yeah. can order again. And she's like, yeah, once, if I start ordering for five days again in a row, then I'll stop brewing at home and, and I'll just keep, uh, I'll keep ordering from the cafes. So I think people get kind of stuck in their habits and then, it takes some shift to happen, and then they get stuck on the new habit. But I would also imagine that uh, when you order, you can actually pick different rows or different beans every time you have a coffee, yeah. which you know you typically wouldn't recommend you having five uh, uh, different you know grinds at home. Yeah, but so I think it's very most customers just want something the something that tastes good and the same thing every time. I don't think that uh, it's only a very small segment of the, uh, the market that really enjoys experimenting with different coffees and uh, different brewing methods and different flavors at different times. Uh, most people have, okay, this is my drink. I'm going to order this uh, with this particular coffee and have it regularly. You know, coming to that point where, you know, people like it in a certain way, etc. I've seen that the, the baristas uh, at Blutokai be very different from the baristas I would see in, say, any other location. What kind of effort goes into training and managing some of these staff? Yeah, so we have a, a training department. We have training managers in all of the cities that we operate. We have training centers in Delhi, Bombay, and Bangalore. So there's a classroom portion that happens before people come to the cafes. There's on the job uh, portion of the training that, that goes into it. There's regular audits that happen and tests where people get to get promoted from lump, one level of barista to another level. So a lot of our focus went into developing baristas as a, as a skill, because actually it is a skill. Uh, I, you know, in maybe three, four or five years ago, people thought of a barista as just a very low skill, low wage position, where actually it takes a lot of effort to to make a good cup of coffee, one, but also to engage with customers. Uh, like that, that's that's as, as important, if not more so important, than being able to make a good cup of coffee. And that is really difficult to teach people. It's yeah, quite easy to teach someone how to operate the equipment in, in the right manner and froth the milk properly and pull a good shot. It's much harder to teach someone how to interact with customers and and give them what they want and, and deal with complaints and, and guide people to, to uh, finding beverages that, that suit their particular uh, taste profile. So do you choose uh, 
you know, so because I would imagine there's certain IQ and EQ that comes with doing that. Um, how do you pick pick them? I, I'm, I'm guessing you don't get them from the market, uh, you know, straight up. No, we so uh, initially we would hire people who had coffee backgrounds uh, because we thought that would give a, a sort of a leg up in, in with the training. Um, but then a lot of those people with coffee backgrounds didn't have the soft skills. So then uh, our whole hiring process changed where we prioritized people who had who were able to come into an interview and explain a concept and, and could uh, demonstrate some uh, analytical abilities in the interview. And those were prioritized over people who had coffee experience. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, hiring is hard, uh, not only at, the, at, at all levels of the organization. So it's not like we have it down to an exact science. Uh, we've gotten better, but there's, there's always room to improve there. So, so you would say that some of these positions are now like uh, aspirational uh, jobs, like if I want to be a minister and do the guy? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely, it's become, uh, there's more, uh, there's, there's some level of prestige associated with it. Um, I think uh, not just at Butokai, but at any of these, uh, you know, premium coffee companies. Uh, it's something that, that you can have a sense of pride in, in, in working at, whereas I think before that maybe wasn't the case. I think also when you're paying people, you know, like 10,000 rupees uh, a month salary, the like that's not enough to live on so then uh, what is the if, if that's sort of the the salary based for this profession then what can you really expect uh from people at, the, at that level so we wanted to to pay a better salary but also equip people with skills to deliver a better experience to the customers that's amazing i i, I think it's always important right because the, the people make the company and and you know investing that is very important um, looking at COVID and, and you know, the next few months and, and of course, uh, growth from here, what's the future? What is the ambition for Blue to Kai? Next few months is uh, we really want to push the online business. So we've seen a lot of new customers coming in uh, to us through our own website, through Amazon. And I think that's uh, an opportunity for us to, to grow at the same time. Uh, we want to have our cafes be places that you can still visit, uh, you feel comfortable visiting, that uh, we have the necessary precautions in place so, so you don't have to worry because I think there is something very comforting about going to a cafe and having a cup of coffee, especially in these times. Um, so uh, we're not looking at it as a time to just survive, but to, to thrive, really. So uh, people are still paying uh, 150 rupees for a coffee. Is that, I don't think that's going to change. Yeah, so far, so far. Uh, mm, I mean, there are definitely uh, a good chunk of people have migrated to making coffee at home because uh, I think more so they're hesitant to step out rather than for the cost saving aspect of it. Uh, but um, there are still people who, who, who are visiting the cafes and ordering online. You have about uh, 20 odd stores now across the country. Yeah, we had 29. And, and do you see that growing now? Or, or are you really looking at um, how you look at new stores, launches, etc.? We had a, a few stores that were almost complete before the lockdown happened. So those will uh, we'll roll those out. We had two, two, two of those stores, two, three of those stores. But beyond that, we're not looking to expand the cafes until we kind of emerge from this COVID situation. What was the earlier... Uh, you know, thought was that going to be uh, you know 100 plus stores by 2020? Yeah, we we'll take it to uh, near to 100 uh, over the next two to three years. The uh, the pre corona plan was to to uh, take it to around 100 stores across the country. Um, now that's still the plan, but the the time frame has been extended. Um, I, I think coffee still is something that people do will continue to consume. Uh, in the short term, because I think it's a it's a small pleasure that somebody has during the day, or, or you know, because it becomes a habit, and and yeah. I guess we will all stick to you know saying repeat. So uh, I, I see also the business is it comes a full circle, right? You started with subscription and, and online orders. Yeah. Now it's kind of I, I think it's just a new uh, kind of high for the business in terms of online ordering. 
and and then yeah. the relationship between online and offline changes a little bit, uh, which is probably yeah. you know um, it's a nice place to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so as much as the cafes uh, uh, we enjoy them, they're very very difficult to to operate. Um, you know, rents are always a concern. Rents in India are incredibly high relative to sort of the revenue that a store can generate. Um, the cafes are the more people intensive part of the business. So that brings along its own set of challenges. Customers in the cafe bring along their own set of challenges and, and you have to have food on top of that. And, you know, we've always been focused on the coffee, but once you start having cafes, you have to add on food because that's what the customers want. Um, so there's a lot of complexity and a lot of challenges in operating cafes. So it's not, uh, though, though over the last few years, a lot of the effort has gone towards them. Uh, it's nice to have kind of a, a reset in a way where now we get to focus on the online part of the business, which maybe we had not focused on so much in the past. Do you see Rurukai uh, owning farms and then having a completely vertically integrated solution like say Cafe Coffee Day? It would be nice to have a farm as a, just where you can control the entire aspect of, of that, you know, the production. I don't think um, well, there's so many different farmers who are doing incredible things with the coffee. I, we wouldn't want to limit to just uh, working with our own farm. Um, I think that also they're coming up with their own own experiments and own processing methods and own varietals that they're they're putting in. And so uh, we want to support that and, and you know, buy from those estates also. But I think it would be nice to have one kind of uh, experimental farm where we can do what we want and. Maybe it'll work and maybe it won't, but at least we'll we'll have that lesson and uh, we'll have control over that aspect. I, I I read somewhere that you wanted to go to Goa and just open uh, a coffee shop and just settle down. Um, so so then if you get a farm, would you just change that plan to say, okay, let's go to a farm? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah farms in Goa are a little bit different. Uh, go. <laughs> Goa well, has the beach, uh, so uh, I and I'm also very much a city person, so I don't think that I could spend my entire uh, time at a at a farm. Uh, I need to I need to be in a city where there are you know, some activity happening. Um, but it would be nice to spend some time at the farm for sure. And now, now that you've chosen this route of of taking investment, uh, growing cafes, and so on. Um, do you see an opportunity to take Lutokai Global? Yeah, there are some uh, international markets that we're looking at. Uh, I think that Indian coffee is underappreciated in terms of the global specialty coffee market. When you go to a cafe in the US or in Europe, it's very rare that you'll see uh, an Indian coffee on the menu. Right. When in fact, there are coffees uh, and estates whose coffee can sit on the, the menu of any coffee. So I think that there is definitely an opportunity there, um, and, and it is part of our plan to to take it outside of India as well. That's very interesting you say that because uh, I also feel that a lot of new roasters etc. are coming up, uh, including the guy, kind of uh, put the focus back on coffee being a local Indian, uh, you know, grown item, uh, which. Yeah. I think to a lot of people, it's still very confusing because they don't understand that, you know, uh, I think for the longest time people said, oh, Italian coffee is amazing, right? So that association of it not being Indian or not being foreign is uh, is a very interesting kind of shift that has happened in the last decade. Yeah. I mean, it still, still happens where people are like, oh, the best coffee comes from Italy and they're just taking coffee from India and roasting it there and sending it back and charging a bomb for it. Uh, but uh, I think for us initially, the it was about making good quality Indian coffee available in India because that wasn't the case. Uh, it's still it's still not very widespread. It still has some ways to go, but I think definitely we're on that path. Uh, whereas you know five ten years down the line, there'll be a, a vibrant domestic. Uh, especially coffee culture here. Um, what's what's your go-to uh, brewing equipment today? I remember Aeropress was your favorite at some point. Yeah, so at home we're making pour-overs, but I still I, I like drinking Americanos. So 
uh, I'm, I've been coming to the office regularly, so I'm getting my Americanos at, at the cafe here. Uh, this is uh, this is house gas. That's not. Uh, uh, say the job. The say okay. the job. The, the the original. Uh, yeah, the first. Fantastic. Uh, hey Matt, do you have any free giveaways for our uh, listeners today? Sure, sure. We can uh, give away a few bags of coffee to to some of your listeners. Oh, what do they have to do to get that uh, coffee? I know. I think you should. Uh, you should. You should come up with some some uh, some requirement or some. <laughs> let's let's have a contest. Uh, I'll, I'll put something out, and, and maybe uh, you know they, they get a chance to uh, get a virtual coffee with Matt. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Hey man, fantastic. This has been great. Uh, say hi to Namrata for me and uh, have a great chatting. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hey guys, that's the end of episode 20 and week 10 of Stars and Startups with me, Varun Bhumini. That was Matt Chitranjan talking about Blue Tokai. Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, do check out the show notes again. And of course, do spread the word. We'd love to see more people accessing our podcast and the amazing speakers that are coming right here. Also, do leave us a feedback if you can on one of the podcasting apps. So, yeah, of course, we'd love more people to find out. Okay, thanks for listening and I will see you on the next episode. Stay safe. Stay safe.